Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers, I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, All Against All, issue number two from Image Comics. Now, this is written by Alex Pagnadel, with artwork by Casper Wingard, and lettering by Hassan Otsman El Hal. I absolutely loved the first issue of this. It made the pick of the week. Issue number two... Pretty much even better. I absolutely adore this book. So it's about this race of aliens who come to the planet Earth years and years, centuries even, after it's been destroyed. Humanity's gone, wiped out. They find, like, DNA for all these animals. They recreate them. They're trying to find weapons. They're trying to find biotechnology that they can use for this, this intergalactic war that they're a part of. And they're just putting all of these earth animals together that shouldn't be together in these biomes and all this kind of stuff. And one of them is a human, right? So in this instance, you have the aliens uh, with like a nature reserve of earth animals and earth creatures, including a human named Helpless. And they go in there to find out what's going on. And the human is like the alien in most of these other sci-fi things. So it, so it flips that script, and I absolutely love it. It has a lot of story to tell, and Casper Wingard, through the art, tells the story fantastically well. These are characters, aside from the human character and some of the animals, the aliens, they don't really have much distinguishing facial features, right? They have a little bit that they can emote through, but Casper Wingard does so much with so little. And the artwork has this rough, raw type feel to it that really helps appropriate the uh, appropriate tone. The colors are amazing. The lettering is amazing. I loved issue number two of All Against All. It also goes back and starts filling in some of the gaps in the story that we knew were there from issue number one, but I had the patience for, and I'm excited to see what happened in the carrying over of momentum. In issue number two of All Against All, also from Image, we have Nemesis Reloaded. This is from Mark Miller and Jorge Jimenez. Jorge Jimenez's artwork in this book is absolutely amazing. The story's okay. So, Nemesis was an early Miller World book. I've never read Nemesis. I've read Kick-Ass, I've read Superior, I've read pretty much everything except for Nemesis, right? But this is kind of like a reboot of Nemesis. Mark Miller has this whole thing in the very beginning where he's like, it's a reboot, it's fresh from here, doesn't matter if you've read the old one before. Nemesis is a Batman type figure, but he's definitely a criminal and he's trying to make a criminal point. And when you get to the end of this book, I thought it was really splendid. What really sells this for me though is Jorge Jimenez. The artwork is incredibly dynamic, just like you would expect from his Batman work, but unlike his Batman work, a little bit more violent, a little bit more sexy, a little bit more, a little bit more groovy, if you know what I'm saying. Nemesis Reloaded, number one. I liked it. Then we got Spawn, Unwanted Violence from Todd McFarlane and Mike Del Mundo. I was very excited to see what this book was going to turn out to be. I was expecting some amazing artwork from Mike Del Mundo. I am a fan of his. He's got this like graffiti type style that is not going to be to necessarily everyone's liking, but it is definitely to my liking. And then I was really impressed by this script from Todd McFarlane. I think it's been one of the best scripts I've seen from him in a long time. I thought it was really cool. So Spawn, uh, and it's set in current Spawn continuity, but it doesn't matter if you've been keeping up with it. But Spawn decides that he's going to find the freak and get the freak to help him um, take care of some business. But I loved the artwork. I really liked the story. I thought Todd did a great job of pacing the dialogue, pacing the narration, not letting it get bogged down, allowing the art to stretch and tell that story, but still use the dialogue to hit certain moments. And I think he even reached a little bit down and also gets pretty dark. And it feels kind of like some of the earlier issues of Spawn. So Spawn Unwanted Violence, first of two issue series. I really liked it. The Black Cloak is a new one from Kelly Thompson, Meredith McLaren, and Becca Carey. Um, it's all right. It's an oversized fantasy world. It was an oversized comic book about a fantasy world in which there's this one character who is a black cloak. So she's like 
an investigator, a, a detective, a policeman or something like that, right? In this fantasy world and it's trying to do world building. It's doing cute, cheeky type stuff that Kelly Thompson is known for, but it just never quite clicked for me. It felt overly long. I couldn't really get into the characters. And by the end of the story, it has a really solid hook, but it took a while to get there. So I don't know as much of a fan as I am at times of Kelly Thompson, this one just didn't quite grab me. Then we got Bone Orchard Mythos, 10,000 Black Feathers, issue number five. This is the final issue of this series. Um, of course, there will be more stuff in the Bone Orchard Mythos. I loved it. Andrea Sorrentino's artwork was absolutely splendid, atmospheric, foreboding, menacing. The coloring here by, is it Dave Stewart? Yes, of course it's Dave Stewart. Robbie, you know that. I absolutely loved this book. I loved the ending. Uh, the way that issue five kind of ties together some threads from issue number one, including the story that these two characters were working on. And I really like this conclusion. I thought it was incredibly satisfying. I thought it was incredibly mysterious. It tied into the overall mythology of the Bone, uh, Bone Orchard mythos and really got me excited to see where this story is going to go because so far this has been a different story than The Passageway, which was a different story than The Free Comic Book Day, but they all are definitely a part of the same world and I am here for Lemire and Sorrentino and Stewart when they work together. So 10,000 Black Feathers was awesome. Little Monsters here with issue number nine. Loving it. It's about kid vampires. They've been told to just stay put. They've been there for years. They don't know they're supposed to feed on humans or anything like that. Some of them find out that they can feed on humans and it split the group. We started going back into the past, exploring some of these characters' lives, these kids' lives before they became vampires. And we now have the promise of a big revelation in the next issue. But Jeff Lemire has been doing a great job of taking a book that started off really slow and he continuously cranks it up. The characters are very engaging by this point. The story is very engaging and it's got a lot of nuance to it. And the artwork by Dustin Wen is absolutely fantastic. He's using like this digital duo shade type thing to provide grayscale, but it works and it works so majestically. I thought Little Monsters was dope. And then we've got Dark Ride issue number four. This might be one of my favorite issues of Dark Rides yet. I really like it. It's about a Disneyland, Disney World type place, but it's all horror themed and it's about the the dark, sinister purpose and machinations of the family that runs it. And there's a power struggle because there's the father and then there's the daughter and the son and everybody's got different parts to play. Meanwhile, there are people investigating this park. They know that something's going on there, something heinous because the place is actually cursed or really, really haunted. People are dying there, stuff like that. And it really cranks it up here towards the end of issue number four. And I thought Josh Williamson and Andre Bresson did an absolutely fantastic job with Dark Ride issue number four. Then we got Bloodstained Teeth issue number eight. I'm loving this book still. I do want to give a big shout out to Heather Moore. I think she is doing a hell of a job coloring this book. The, the artwork itself is very photo uh, realistic, photo reference probably, and it could easily feel very stiff, but it's not because the colors provide movement, energy, and excitement, right? It really does. Bloodstained Teeth has been a good book. It's about this dude who turns humans into vampires. He's a vampire. He turns humans into vampires for profit. But in this world, the Vampire Council says you're not supposed to turn humans into vampires, so he has to go and kill all the vampires that he's turned. Each issue is basically its own thing. And this one, he goes after a, a Gordon Ramsay vampire, basically. And uh, I liked it. But the coloring is so solid on that. Then we got Gunslinger Spawn here, issue 16. First of all, David Mack right there. That is the cover of the week for the second week of 2023 is Gunslinger Spawn 16, David Mack. I had so much fun with this one. Todd McFarlane does a great job with this script as well. And Brett Booth does a great job with the artwork of making it flow, making it feel energetic. There is a speedster superhero-ish character that's introduced here. I love the play between him, uh, them and Javi. I really love the energy that Brett Booth is bringing to the page. We've seen Brett Booth do work on stuff like Flash before. This one feels a little bit more raw, a little bit more visceral. And I think that's a really solid approach. Gunslinger Spawn continues to be super fun. And yes, cover of the week. It's back. Don't worry. Smell of the week's coming up soon. From DC Comics, we got Lazarus Planet 
Alpha. So this is spinning out of the events of Batman Superman World's Finest, the first arc, into Batman vs. Robin. It spews into this. Basically what's happened is Lazarus Island has exploded. A giant volcano has spit all this Lazarus pit residue up into the atmosphere, and it's starting to affect the atmosphere, I've already said that, is starting to affect reality, it's starting to affect people, superheroes, their powers are wonky, it's acting weird. Uh, Batman's infected with something, they're trying to get him to a place, Robin's got to take command. Um, I did think it was a pretty decent book, it's got a backup story, it's more tied into the monkey print stuff, which is going to tie in a little bit with the Lazarus planet, but this is going to be a series of miniseries, and you can definitely see how it's laid out while you're reading this book. This is like the main stuff, there's going to be an Omega, and then stuff in between is going to be mostly stuff in between. So I don't like events that are structured like this or set up like this. And as much as I love Ricardo Federici's artwork, I do feel like it didn't quite capture an energy that something like this needed. So it kind of felt epic, but at the same time, not quite so much. So it's reaching high, not quite getting there, but it's decent enough. Then we got Batman The Adventures Continue, season three, issue number one. Uh, Alan Burnett, Paul Dini and company. I'm liking it. I mean, if you, if you want to go back to those days, of the Batman animated series, this is it for you. And it's not kidified, it's not for kids, it is more for, you know, those of us that grew up watching this show, right? So it's kind of got a little bit more of a mature, darker tone to it, right? It's not so kidified like I was saying. But I mean, you know what's the deal. This is season three of this series. They've already done a few of these mini series. You know what to expect. Um, in this one, it seems like they're setting up, uh, seems like they're setting up Suicide Squad. So we've already had the, the Red Hood stuff going on, and then we had uh, Azrael stuff going on. There's an um, Suicide Squad, so that's pretty cool. Then we got Batman and the Joker Deadly Duo, issue number three. This is definitely the weakest issue artistically so far. It just feels not quite as elaborate or as fleshed out or as well done or as well printed. I think feel I feel like something, some part of it might be the printing because once again, you get some of the the black and white inked worked in the back from Mark Silvestri and it looks really cool, but maybe there's something about the way it's printed or the way it's colored. Something just felt off with the artwork in this one, but it was still fine. But the story was pretty cool still. It's basically somebody's kidnapped Harley Quinn. Joker's put Gordon in a dangerous situation so that Batman has to be forced to team up with the Joker. It takes a while for that to actually happen, but there's some really interesting ideas and concepts in this book. So I don't think it's ultra terrible, and it's the art is, of course, the big seller. Then we got Batman Incorporated, issue number four. I loved this series. So in the last issue of this series, I said, you know, the artwork is kinetic. Uh, the story is fine. I'm really intrigued by this. these revelations of Ghostmaker's past. He had a former sidekick that he believed was dead. Now that sidekick is back, and the sidekick trying to take out Ghostmaker, and by way of Ghostmaker, Batman Incorporated, and Clown Hunter, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but I said that the focus was too much on Ghostmaker and not enough on Batman Incorporated on those individual characters. Well, they do get a big spotlight here while the Ghostmaker plot does maintain center focus. So I thought that that balance was really well done in issue number four and evened it out from the last issue. So I think this is going to read really well when it's collected in trade. I think it reads really well issue to issue though. Great, like really crazy dynamic artwork, really great coloring pop, bold, and just a great fun use of these characters. Batman Incorporated, I liked it. Then we got Flash 790, the start of the one minute war. Um, so we basically have a, everybody's kind of chilling. Wally's having like a barbecue. Uh, Barry's getting like, uh, having a having a conversation with Iris. All the members of the Flash family are just doing their business, doing their due. When this alien race comes up, who seems to be able to slow time, and that's how they conquer planets, by the planet not being allowed to have any kind of response because they basically destroy and conquer the planet in one minute. Well, Earth's got the flashes. So this is the very briefest of beginnings, but it has some major ramifications already. And I, yell, I love the utilization of all these different Flash characters, including Max Mercury. So I thought Flash 790 was pretty solid. Wildcats number three, I'm having fun with this book, ironing out. I, of course, would love just to, uh, to go back into that 90s world or even go back into the Joe Casey world. But what Matt Rosenberg is doing with this new Wildcat series is he's taking things Things that worked from the 90s run, he's taking things that worked from the 2000s Joe Casey run, and he's doing his own thing with it, right? I do wish it wasn't quite so plugged into the DC universe, but 
you know what? I really don't care because this is a fun book. The characters all ring true. Their voices are accurate like Grifter, like Zealot, like Marlowe. And I'm excited the more we learn about what's going on. Of course, this is just a mini-series. I would love to see this be upgraded to an ongoing and maybe focus just a bit more on the Wildcats and stuff. But I'm tired of them playing around. I want to know what the gist is, but we are getting there. I'm liking it. Then we got Danger Street, issue number two. Great artwork from Jorge Fornes and Dave Stewart, but the story's just not doing much for me. I didn't think the first issue was that solid, but it did hook me by the end of it. But it's a bunch of like C-list characters in a sad, depressed Tom King type plot. Um, and in issue number two, pretty much nothing happens. There's like two things that move forward just a little bit, but that could easily have been done in just a couple pages, but it's a whole issue. So it's a whole long drawn out issue that leads to one moment that could have been gotten to really quickly. So this was a Tom King book I did not like, but Human Target number 10 was a Tom King book I am liking. I'm really liking this book. Uh, the mystery is starting to come, become a little bit more clear in here and who's responsible for accidentally poisoning our uh, main character here. He's only got 12 days to live. Each issue is a day. He's trying to investigate why um, it's wrapped up in an interesting uh, reimagining of the Justice League International characters, including Ice. Ice is just so adorable in this book, and I just, I got a thing for Ice in the world of Human Target, probably because of that great artwork from Greg Smallwood. But I'm liking this book. I am. I am. Let's jump over to Marvel. And from Marvel, we have Avengers War Across Time, issue number one, start of a new miniseries with artwork by Alan Davis, which is the best part of this book. I really did like the artwork. It is a classic vibing type feeling story. That was a weird way to say that, but it's written by Paul Levitt, so it's definitely gonna have that old school approach with the writing too, but I was impressed that it didn't feel like overly verbose and it actually still had a nice flow to it. Very plugged into some early issues of Avengers and Tales of Suspense and stuff. It's Kang related. It's gonna be timey-wimey, but it just didn't really work. So I know that they got Kang coming out in the Ant-Man movie next month. So that's probably why this exists on shelves, just to have an Avengers Kang story going on, but it didn't completely work for me, but if you're a hardcore Alan Davis fan, you might want to check that out. Then we got Amazing Spider-Man issue 17, the next part of the Dark Web series. We got three Dark Web books today. Um, Amazing Spider-Man number 17, and I've been liking the Amazing Spider-Man bits of Dark Web, but not this one. Still got great artwork from Ed McGinnis, but now that Spidey is in limbo, so he's experiencing his own vision of hell, it's just a little overly silly. Still not sold on the Ben Riley thing. It's all right, but for a series that so far I had low expectations and was digging, this was the weakest part in the main thread of it so far. It just kind of felt, it just kind of felt like a waste of time. Like it could have been truncated a little bit and let's move it along. But this is the moment where everything's in limbo, in hell or whatever. And that goes into Miss Marvel. She's in limbo. She's out of limbo. This is fine. It's not essential to Dark Web, but if you are reading the ongoing adventures and history of Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, this is the step. So whether you're following Dark Web or not, if you're following uh, Miss Marvel and through her series of mini series and mini series and mini series, um, this is definitely your next step. This is the final issue of it. So it wraps everything up in a nice tidy little bow. Not essential, but tied in, I guess a little bit. Then we got Mary Jane and Black Cat. Um, not essential for Dark Web at all, but if you're following Jed McKay's work on Black Cat, this is the next step. Um, Black Cat is running around with Mary Jane. Mary Jane's got powers. We don't know where that's come from, whatever, but all the stuff with Limbo's going on, they get tasked to go and steal the Soul Sword. So it's something that is right in line with what Jed McKay does and has been doing with the Black Cat series. So if you're liking his work on Black Cat, which I am, you definitely want to check that out. Then we got Miles Morales Spider-Man issue number two. I loved issue number one. Issue number two, pretty good as well. Let me tell you something. The artwork in this is absolutely amazing. Vincentin Vincentini is just giving us some of those, it's not like Todd McFarlane-esque as far as the line work, but it's Todd McFarlane-esque as far as the energy, as far as the composition, as just, I love the feeling of a Marvel Spider-Man book that feels big, adventurous, dynamic, explosive, like go freaking figure. So I'm really liking it. I'm liking Cody Ziegler's take on Miles and on Miles' world. It's got a nice pace to it. The artwork is amazing flamboyantly awesome. 
Miles Morales Spider-Man, two issues in, I'm really digging it. Then we got Daredevil number seven, loved this issue. So you got uh, uh, De La Torre and uh, Chichetto, I believe. I think Chichetto's on here, yeah, Chichetto's on here too. So the artwork is, it's weird because it should feel more inconsistent, but it's not because I think uh, De La Torre carries most of the weight here. Chichetto has a few pages here and there, um, but I'm loving this buildup of what Matt's trying to do. Matt's married to Elektra now. They're running the fist and they're going up against the hand and they're building up to this ultimate battle between Daredevil and the hand or Daredevil and the fist and Punisher and the hand. And I'm loving that buildup. I think that's great. But I also love the exploration of Matt, misguided or not, trying to do a different approach to incarceration. Uh, he has been taking villains out and breaking them out of prison and putting them in his own prison and then taking them out on superhero excursions with him. And there's some nice powerful moments involving some old school Daredevil villains in here and I loved the ending. So Daredevil's, Daredevil's really ironed itself out for me. Then we got Moon Knight here with issue number 19. Moon Knight just wrapped up a pretty much a big story but we still got this Zodiac thing out there. So this was a great it was a great, like, I don't know if this is a great jumping on point, but it's a great issue to just kind of take a moment, sit back, recontextualize everything that's happened over 18 issues, that's a year and a half, and then set up a path to move the story forward with some really interesting revelations about the fists of Khonshu and their resurrection protocols, and of course with Zodiac and what he's doing. So I'm liking it. The artwork is still dynamic. It is a... Uh, Zabatini, not as good as the typical artist, but still pretty solid. I'm liking Moon Knight. Carnage number nine, it's just not working for me, right? Carnage, the symbiote is split. You got Cletus in person, like, like in the mind of this one person. Then you got the suit taking this other person. One's a detective, one's a serial killer. Basically, Carnage is running around doing all this stuff in like, in like dark elf world or wherever, where is that Niflheim? I think um, it's doing all this kind of cosmic space as guardian type stuff that doesn't really seem to fit with Carnage. But then when you get to the end of this issue, pretty dope, pretty dope. When you get to the end of this issue, especially if you've been a fan of symbiote stuff for the last several years, um, you're going to like, you're going to like what's going on. At the end of that one. Then we get Savage Avengers issue number nine from David Popose. Really liking what he's doing on this book. You can tell he's got a love for the 2099 world just like I do. He utilizes it to the fullest. I love his interpretation of that world of Jack Gallows, Punisher 2099 in particular. I love the use of Doom. I love all the Deathlock stuff. I think David Popose has got a bright future at Marvel and at any other comic book publisher that would have him because he's a great idea dude and a great executor of those ideas. Just takes them out. Just, just takes out those ideas. Anyway, Something is Killing the Children is here with issue number 28. And you ready for this? Smell of the Week is Something is Killing the Children 28. Boom, does it again. That smells like a comic book should. Smells like a bookstore. Smells like paper. Smells like knowledge. Smells like inspiration. So that's always cool. Something is Killing the Children number 28. We finally get to the part of the story where we've had all this threat of of the House of Slaughter coming after Erica, setting her up, finding out where she is, and now it's actually starting to happen. And this was a rather tense issue. I liked this issue. The smell of the week. The art was... Della Dera, I feel, is getting... I, I don't... It's not that the art's bad, but there is something different about it. It almost feels like more shortcut or just more... I don't know. There's something like... Almost feels like there's a loss of focus, maybe... It's hard to do the same thing over and over and keep it interesting and fresh. Not talking smack about the artwork, though it just seems, actually just seems like I did. Art's okay. Story, though, starting to ramp back up for me on Something is Killing the Children. Then we have Know Your Station, issue number two. This is about space station out there. Think of this big, like, royal cruise for rich people getting away from the terrible planet that's, like, burning underneath them. And on there, uh, a murder happens, and now, like, a security liaison has to, while she's trying to kick some heavy drugs, have to uh, solve this murder, right? So the story's okay. I think it irons out some things. I think Issue one was a bit clunky, but issue two kind of ironed some of that out. I love the artwork from Liana Kangas. They do an absolutely phenomenal job with issue number two of Know Your Station. So I love the art. I like the concept. There's some really funny bits here. So the script's starting to kind of come together a little bit more for me. And then once again, we get to another ending where I'm like, I'm really excited 
to see how this develops in issue number three. Also from Boom, we have Specs, issue number three, the penultimate issue of Specs, written by David M. Boer with artwork by Chris Sheehan, Roman Stevens rounding out that team. I really like this book, so it's about these Specs, these glasses, these uh, two young men find, and when they put them on and they make a wish, the wish happens. But it gets all twisted, and as a result of their first wish, which was to get rid of this bully, they are, one of them are now accused of murder. Right? So now the dude's trying to figure out how to use the specs to help his friend, who he's kind of crushing on, but his friend doesn't know he's crushing on. He doesn't even know if his friend would be cool with that. So you got all that drama going on, and a really interesting story, and it gets into some dark territory here where it starts explaining the history of these specs and all the different people that it's affected. This series could become an anthology type thing, something akin to Silver Coin if they really wanted to do it. But that being said, love the art, love the story, love the emotion, loved it all the way through. From Black Box Comics, we got Dream Master issue number two. This is written by Jonathan Hedrick. Yes, Jonathan Hedrick. And uh, you know it's always cool to see comics with Bueller's name in a comic book, absolutely. So I loved Dream Master issue number one, and I loved issue number two. It's a nice, breezy read. Um, it's filled with imagination and dark stuff. So it's about this dude named the Dream Master who is in the world of dreams, in your nightmares, and there are these entities that he is there to stop, to kill, before especially they break into the real world through nightmares. It is a really cool book. It sounds like it could easily just be a ripoff of something like Sleepwalker or Sandman. And remember, you know, Sandman Sandman was, or Sleepwalker was supposed to be Sandman done right. I think that's what Tom DeFalco said back in the day. Anyway, I love the art. I love the story. I love the pace of it. I love the ideas, and I love the gnarly, nightmarish visuals in it. So that's a good one. Then we got, from Dark Horse Comics, we got The Ones. The Ones is all right. It's all right. So I actually didn't mind issue one. Didn't mind issue two. Issue three, Bendis starts doing that thing where he's structurally going back in time to fill in gaps, and then going back, and it just... It just becomes too cutesy, it just becomes too silly, and all of the threat gets undercut for me in issue three. And so even though this is just a four-issue series, I ain't doing it. I don't think I'm going to do it. Then we got Mindset issue number six. This is the final issue of Mindset, and I loved the ending. This was one of the best books of last year. It didn't quite make my top 20, but it was definitely top 25. In fact, if I redid my top 20, it might make it in. Um, but Mindset's a really solid book. The artwork by John Pearson has been phenomenal. Zach Kaplan has been giving us a really interesting uh, science fiction tale about the influence of social media in our lives, uh, not just in influencing us as far as what we buy and what we act, but even even influencing our ambition, even influencing our wish to be influencers and to be influenced. And it talks about that symbiotic relationship between media and humanity and, and influence in humanity. And the way it wraps up, it kind of unnecessarily a couple times tries to wrap around itself too many times to make it too confusing at the end, but it's still an easy to understand ending, but it's got some ambigu ambiguity to it. Um, that I did find rather refreshing. And I love the artwork. I love how experimental it's been and innovative in the art. And what could have come across as a very verbose, clunky script, not that the script and dialogue is clunky, because it's not, it's really solid, but the wrong type of art on this type of story, it wouldn't feel as free-flowing as it does. It has a very quick pace, which is really interesting when you look at a layout of a page to think that it has, a, I, I love this book. I thought it was absolutely amazing. Then we've got end after end issue number five. This is from DB Andre, uh, Tim Daniel, Sunando. Um, I'm liking this book more and more as it progresses. What started off as seemed to like do a simple idea. So you die and you wind up in this world where you're caught in this never ending war. And it's about this dude who has to learn to accept that which he hated about himself or what he was afraid to do in life. And, he has to apply that to his afterlife, and it's it's got some deep resonating type type layers there about what it's saying about about what it's saying. I don't know. I don't want to speak for Andrea and Daniel and what they're trying to say here, but for me, what I'm picking up out of this book is even when you're giving yourself too hard of a time in life. Don't, <laughs> because you have courage in you, and and it sucks that in this in this case, this character has to get to the afterlife to realize it. 
But in doing that, he's also re making strong connections with others. This was just a really good one. This was a really good one, a good exploration on, on depression, actually, and a good exploration on dark seated depression and war, the war within. And the war without. I don't know. Really liking it. So, that's why I read. So, end after end, really liking it. Mindset, fantastic conclusion. The ones, I'm out of it. Dream Master, really solid. Great book from Black, uh, Black Box Comics. Specs, really cool book. Know Your Station, evening it out a little bit. Something is Killing the Children, smell of the week. Then we got Savage Avengers, having so much fun in 2099 with David Popose. We got Carnage. Haven't really been digging it that much, but I love the ending on this one. Moon Knight, having fun with it. Then we got Daredevil and Miles Morales Spider-Man. I'm loving those ones too. Mary Jane Black Cat. If you like Black Cat, check it out. Miss Marvel's only for Miss Marvel fans. It's not going to give you much dark web. Didn't really like this issue of Spider-Man. Felt like it was kind of a waste of time. This one, this Avengers one, just did not work for me. Loving one Tom King book, hating another Tom King book, story of my life. Wildcats, I'm really digging it. Flash, the one minute war, starts off with the bang. Batman Incorporated continues the bangs, and the bangs go bang, bang, boogie to the boogity beat. Anyway, Batman the Joker, the artwork takes a little bit of a step down, but it's still got some interesting stuff. Batman the Adventures continue, continues to do what Batman the Adventures continues does. Continues to do, does. Lazarus Planet, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, Gunslinger Spawn had a lot of fun with that. Bloodstained Teeth had a lot of fun with that. Dark Ride, one of the best issues of that one yet. Little Monsters and Bone Orchard Mythos. Jeff Lemire being Jeff Lemire with two of the greatest artists out there, Andrea Sorrentino and Dustin Wynn. Black Cloak didn't quite work for me, but doesn't mean that it's DOA. Spawn Unwanted Violence loved that artwork, loved the artwork in Nemesis. Reloaded, but the pick of the week was all against all. So cover of the week was Gunslinger Spawn. Pick of the week was all against all. Smell of the week. Something's killing the children. What are you reading? What are you digging? Thank you so much for checking out the video. Let us know in the comments below. Um, let's keep this conversation going and the positive vibes about comic books, whether we like them or not, they're still fun. Anyway, I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking. Thanks for liking, sharing, subscribing, all that stuff. Have we done all that? Have we? All right. Station. Pop, pop. Boom. <laughs>